Hi, my name is Alex Dolphin, and welcome back to another episode of Ex Ante. Today, we're going to discuss DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. We're going to discuss the governance regimes that they are under and the certain states that they can incorporate within and what the problems might be with that current state of governance. Let's go ahead and jump in. So what is a DAO? A DAO, I think simply put, is in, an internet native collective. Um, it's a group of people that are getting together and that coordination is facilitated by the blockchain. The DAO is an organization that runs on the blockchain. So members in a DAO are token holders, you might call them, are owners and controllers of the DAO. Um, they are owners via their tokens and then they control via voting. So every member in the DAO has a vote um, that they can use. They can use that voice um, to voice their opinion on certain proposals that other token holders will put before the DAO. Um, DAOs run on decentralized blockchain infrastructure. Um, to understand a DAO, you don't really need to understand all of the nuances of the blockchain. What are the different types of chains? You know, what's the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum? You do need to know at the basic level that this infrastructure is decentralized. Um, tokens are issued via the blockchain and they're held, you know, in blockchain wallets, these types of things. Um, and DAOs may or be more or less autonomous. That just depends on the type of the DAO. So you have decentralized, which is the blockchain. You could also say it's de decentralized because there's a democratic governance regime in a DAO. It's autonomous because the choices of those individuals, the group of DAO members is are executed by smart contracts. And DAOs might be, like I said, more or less autonomous in the sense that some DAOs might be fully run by code um, where there's humans really don't touch much at all. And there might be other DAOs where smart contracts are essentially kind of just the facilitator. Um, so the whole organization isn't autonomous. So it's an organization, right? So a DAO could be used for business and non-business use purposes. Um, essentially, the use cases are as wide as you could imagine, but some concrete ones as an example. So some people are using DAOs uh, for venture capital, essentially, or uh, investment clubs. In this way, you might have a group of individuals that pool their capital in a DAO and then use that capital. Um, they essentially vote how they're going to use that capital. It's a little bit different than a traditional VC fund where you might have a general partner that's making those um, decisions. So DAO could also be used for a special acquisition. I mean, we've seen this with, with the Constitution DAO. Um, trying to buy a copy of the Constitution. We've also seen it with Spice DAO, trying to buy a copy of the director or the the director of Dune's uh, Bible, quote unquote. We can also see it where I, some people have talked about trying to buy a sports team with a DAO. I mean, the 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 possibilities are essentially limitless in the business uh, world. Also, you've probably seen DAOs as uh, governance over DeFi projects. Uh, Maker is one, uh, for instance, which is probably one of the most heralded DAOs. And then also, you could see it over NFT projects. Uh, we've seen this with the Nouns DAO. We've also seen this um, with the ApeCoin DAO. So governance over NFT projects, interesting use of a, a DAO as well. It can also be used for non-business use purposes, right? So think about the, the DAOs that were um, created for donating to Ukraine. Think of other things like that, charity DAOs. Also an interesting idea, um, raised by Balaji is essentially you could use a DAO to govern a nation. Um, this is a governance tool and, and it could be used to govern people politically. So how are DAOs different from other business organizations? Now, collective decisions are executed via smart contracts. This will reduce the need for intermediaries, also reduces the need for a C-suite of executives. So in this way, um, just the structure of a DAO using smart contracts might reduce the overhead costs for a business organization, might be able to combat you know, wildly excessive CEO pay, some might say. Um, this is, I think, the key, uh, is that DAOs are directly democratic. So when you look at a traditional corporation, um, a traditional fund, essentially you're gonna have investors. Those might be the shareholders or um, the investors in a fund, limited partners. Those people are gonna deploy the capital. And once they deploy the capital, you'll have other people that are delegated the control of that organization. So you might have a board in the corporate context, um, a general partner in the fund context. Those people get to decide what they wanna do. Now in a DAO, there is no delegated controller traditionally. 
And so all of the decisions are going to be made by the collective uh, via democratic process. So there's pros with that and that everyone has a voice um, and that everyone is able to kind of voice their opinion and say, hey, we should do this. We should not do this. You might get better decisions because you're functioning through this collective. There's downsides of that and that coordination problems uh, greatly increase in a DAO um, because you're having to, you know, this is essentially why people, uh, the founders of the United States thought direct democracy, you know, democracy for every single action is inefficient, right? Um, it's really tough to get that type of coordination. So you might need a delegated um, controller like the Congress or the president. Um, but it's an interesting idea. Um, the wider the DAO goes, the coordination problems are going to probably be larger and the narrower, fewer coordination problems. General rule in DAO democracy is one token, one vote. So one natural person might have outsized voting control because of uh, uh, they've gathered a lot of tokens, right? So another interesting aspect of DAOs is that they might be owned by the workers. Um, DAOs, essentially, someone could go work for a DAO and get paid in DAO tokens. And they could also go work for multiple DAOs at once. These workers could be fluid, jump in and out of DAOs, and, and, and do that. Now, also, with those tokens that they might be rewarded, they would get control rights over an organization. And so this isn't really something that we see in today's economic infrastructure is a lot of labor control over, over organizations, but a DAO might allow more labor control and more of a labor voice uh, in a business organization. So what states can DAOs incorporate in currently in the United States? Well, you've got three options. Um, first, you can incorporate uh, directly in Wyoming as a DAO. Second, directly as Wy in, Wy or in Tennessee as a DAO. And then third, you could incorporate theoretically in any jurisdiction as a wrapped DAO. Essentially, this means you're just going to incorporate as an LLC. Um, this was uh, created by Aaron Wright, Open Law, so you got to give credit there. Um, but now that there's direct incorporation, um, we might not see as many wrapped DAOs as we have before. So what duties do members in the DAO owe one another? Um, the default in Wyoming and Tennessee is that the members in a DAO owe zero fiduciary duties to one another. So fiduciary duty is essentially something saying, I have to act in your best interest. Um, theoretically, a DAO could incorporate fiduciary duties. So make the members of a DAO all owe fiduciary duties to one another, um, but they're not required to. And they're not really even encouraged to um, with the laws that have been passed. Now the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, it's a contract law doctrine. Both states provide that this cannot be waived. Um, now in Delaware, a similar scenario where um, the default is that fiduciary duties exist, but in an alternative entity like an LLC, the members uh, in the operating agreement can essentially waive all fiduciary duties. So we're dealing with a zero fiduciary duty landscape when we look at DAOs. Now you might ask, what's the problem with that? So um, some people say there's no problem with it. Um, Aaron Wright says there's no problem with it. I think that there is a problem with it. Um, so to understand that problem, let's just jump into agency problems generally. So an agency problem, uh, an easy way to think of it is if you were to hire a plumber to work on your house, but you weren't there to supervise the plumber. Um, and so that plumber might not work as hard as they, as they would like to now that you've paid them, right? They might not solve that problem. That's an agency problem. In a traditional corporation, we would look at the shareholders delegating their control rights to a corporate board that then essentially gets to control the corporation. Now that corporate board has its own interests. The corporate, the directors are humans too. And they might act in their own self-interest instead of the shareholder's best interest. And that is the fundamental agency problem. Um, this agency problem forms the basis for fiduciary duties in corporate law. Um, with delegated power, that person might act not in the delegator's best interest. And so that's why we have fiduciary duties. They're essentially an efficient solution to agency problems. They require that person, the board, or whoever else has been delegated power to act in the best interest of the person who delegated it, the shareholders. And if they don't, well, the shareholders can sue the board for not acting in the best interest. Generally, what we're thinking of here is we're thinking of self-dealing, using the power that was delegated, the funds that were delegated um, by the shareholders for the board's own enrichment, personal enrichment. That's self-dealing. That's kind of what fiduciary duties are trying to pre prevent, essentially. So 
DAOs, right? Um, we talked about it's, it's direct dem democratic governance. Everyone has control. There is no delegated board, right? The, traditionally, there is no delegated control. There's no general partner. So we don't need fiduciary duties, some might say. We, why, why would we need fiduciary duties? The, the agency problems are maybe eliminated, probably muted. Well, that's not really the case. Um, I'm going to start with the fact that DAOs follow the one token, one vote rule. So if you have a controlling token holder, someone that has an outsized portion of voting control, let's just say greater than 50%, well, that person could essentially vote and unilaterally control the DAO. And in that sort of a situation, you're going to have the minority. So anyone who's in the 49% block, that person becomes an agent and the controlling uh, token holder would become the principal. So there is an agency problem that arises in a DAO because of the one token, one vote rule. Um, a delegate. So DAOs have delegation regimes and these regimes, token holders that don't want to vote, they don't want to like, you know, take the time to scrutinize all these proposals. They might just say, hey, someone else vote my shares, vote my tokens. Well, in that type of scenario, yeah, we have another agency problem. That person with the delegated voting power might use that voting power for their own self-benefit. And then third, we've seen in some DAOs the creation of a DAO governance board. And the, the main one that I've seen this in recently is the ApeCoin DAO. Um, they have this DAO governance board. You know, admittedly, it has a limited role. Generally, it just serves a veto role, but it still has power and, and it still is going to become an agent of the token holders. Any type of centralized board within a DAO is gonna resurrect the agency problems that the, that the direct democratic structure sought to eliminate. So yeah, you might get more efficiency, um, but agency problems, they come back, they rear their ugly heads. So what's the problem? When we have no, zero, when we have no fiduciary duties in DAOs, well, we might have these agents use their delegated power to self deal. Um, so what might this look like? Well, for instance, um, say you have a majority token holder in a DAO. Well, they might use all of the DAO's funds to invest in their own NFT project or something like that, their own DeFi project. They might do so where they're basically siphoning the funds from the DAO and taking it and putting it into their own project, taking away that value from those minority token holders and just rolling it into their own project. This is self-dealing, why? Because the controller stands on both sides of the transaction. Um, this could be problematic. If you're in that minority portion of the DAO, well, you probably aren't gonna like the idea of someone just putting all of your funds into their own project that might not be good, might be good, we don't know. But with they have controlling uh, voting control, they can do that. The same is true of a delegate, and the same is true of a DAO governance board, depending on the power that it has, right? Okay, so, we don't know for sure if that can self-deal. It's not very clear, this is all new. Um, but there are two controls on self-dealing in DAOs that currently exist. So the first is private, privately ordered controls. And I think this is the one that would be most lauded um, by advocates of a zero fiduciary duty regime. So what are some examples of these? Rage quitting. So a DAO member can essentially rage quit at any point and take their pro rata share of the DAO's treasure, treasury funds. Okay, this is definitely going to prevent some opportunism. The problem is if the money's already gone, there's no money to rage quit with, right? Um, and so it's, it's effective, it's an effective deterrent, but it might not be completely capable of eliminating self-dealing and opportunism in DAOs. Second, you might have a quorum voting requirement. So Tennessee and Wyoming both impose quorum voting requirements. This is just to say that, you know, if only 10% of the DAO members show up to a smart contract proposal vote, well, we don't have a quorum, we can't do anything in the DAO. We have to you know, get to some type of threshold before we're gonna allow anything to happen. We might have maximum token ownership limits. We might say, um, we've seen Flamingo DAO do this. I think it's eight or 9%. You can't own more than eight or 9% of the available tokens. Um, this essentially is combating that controlling token holder problem that we talked about earlier um, in an ex ante, privately ordered control. So, but both of these, I think they're kind of missing the fact that we might have outsized token holders um, with, with voting control, right? So you might have three token holders, say three token holders with 15% uh, or 20% voting control. If they all get together, they can act like a single controller. And you might just say, well, that's the, what happens when we have democracy in a DAO. Well, the problem is, what happens if the other 40% is very small, you know, and they're diluted? Well, you know, there, there we could have a problem again. And so that's where 
the flexibility of fiduciary duties as an ex post control on opportunism would be helpful. When you have people that can try and circumvent DAO, um, DAO requirements, well, the ex post aspect of fiduciary duty would be helpful. I think it's also worth mentioning just very briefly the Sybil attack, which is an idea that you might have one person um, that basically shadows its control by using multiple blockchain wallets, um, by using uh, multiple pseudonymous and, uh, um, identities. And so if in that type of an attack, you might have someone that's a controller, but we don't really know it's a controller. So a quorum voting requirement probably isn't going to solve this problem. But, um, but you know, if you have some type of KYC, know your customer requirement, you might be able to solve it. All this is to say that privately ordered controls are probably expensive. Um, they might be inefficient. Uh, it's going to take a lot of contracting costs to create these types of controls on opportunism. And fiduciary duties are more efficient, um, arguably. They're just going to come in. They're going to look at the situation. They're going to see if there was self-dealing. They're going to see if it's fair. And those fiduciary duties might be less costly to DAOs generally. I just want to end uh, basically with my argument against privately ordered controls being the solution, although I do I think they're great, but I don't think they're the solution, um, is Vice Chancellor Laster's statement. He said this in a Stanford lecture. It is physically impossible at the outset to foresee all future states of the world and contract for them. And I think that's just prescient. Like, um, you know, it's, it's ideal to say we could uh, create these ex ante controls against opportunism and we're going to be able to do it perfectly before we even begin in the DAO. But I think it's a harder thing to actually do um, because of what it requires us to do. It was just to kind of stare into a crystal ball and try and foresee everything. Um, and yeah, lawyers get paid a lot of money to do that. Um, but essentially, it's not perfect. You know, no one can foresee all future states of the world perfectly um, and prevent that type of opportunism that might arise. So we talked about the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing earlier. Um, none of the states allow DAOs to waive this, um, but this isn't a really especially strong ex post control on opportunism. It's a contract doctrine. The implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing is contract doctrine. It's not a fiduciary duty. That's very clear. And I think everyone would agree with that, right? That's um, A is not B. Yes, we agree. Um, and just a few things to note, you know, Williston on contracts says courts declined to find a breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing absent a breach of an express term of the contract. Strine and Laster, the implied covenant, um, they have a great paper on this, uh, the siren song of, uh, of alternative entities and limiting fiduciary duties. The implied covenant is far different from fiduciary duties, a focus on the explicit terms of the contract, not the state of mind of the defendant. So you're gonna see, what do you have to do um, to bring a claim under the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing? Well, you probably have to have something in the contract. Um, you need to have an express term in the contract. And when the contracts either you know, don't integrate fiduciary duties or purport to waive them, um, these operating agreements, these natural language contracts, it's going to kind of be hard for a court to use the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. They might be tempted to, and if they do use that to rectify harm by self-dealing, the implied covenant kind of might morph with fiduciary duties. What does that look like? Well, it creates more unpredictability around the implied covenant. Currently, it's, it's just, it is unpredictable. We don't know what the implied covenant really is. There's a great podcast with Mitsu Galati um, and Mark Weidemeyer, clauses and controversies with some University of Pennsylvania law professors that just discuss, this is a really unpredictable thing. We don't know what the implied covenant is, but let me tell you, we do know fiduciary duties. We do know what they are. Um, every law school has a biz orgs class about what fiduciary duties are, what they might look like. And so if the implied covenant is going to begin to take on the role of fiduciary duties, let's just use fiduciary duties. Um, that's more clear. It's going to be more predictable and there won't be this kind of morphing ugliness. Uh, I just want to end with, you know, token holders, members in a DAO should not expect the implied covenant to function like a fiduciary duty would. So Alex, you've given us a lot of problems. What's the solution? Okay. The solution is fiduciary duties um, in a regime that is tailored to DAOs. So what does that mean? It means limited yet mandatory fiduciary duties that are imposed on all token holders. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're going to eliminate the duty of care. That is a duty that just requires all people to act with you know, up, you know, know, care, reasonable care towards one another in a DAO. That might stand in the way of innovation. 
Um, and we already allow waivers of the duty of care in corporate law. We haven't seen you know terrible things happen. Um, risky decisions might be more valuable than not risky decisions. So we're just going to say duty of care, it's eliminated for DAOs. We don't need it in DAOs. Okay. We're going to eliminate the corporate opportunity doctrine. What's that? It's a doctrine that says if you are a fiduciary to someone, you can't take. So if you're a board member on a corporation, you can't take an opportunity for that corporation for yourself. And why might this be problematic in a DAO? Well, it'd be problematic because you're going to have workers. Web3 wants to make it so workers can just fly in and out of DAOs. And if they're going to do that, if we put the corporate opportunity doctrine on them, well, that might prevent that, you know, cool, cool thing, that cool new thing for workers where you could work for multiple DAOs at once. If the corporate opportunity doctrine is imposed on token holders, well, then they're not going to be able to move fluidly in and out of DAOs. They probably aren't going to be able to invest in uh, crypto, blockchain, these types of assets on their own without bringing those opportunities to the DAO. It could just really stand in the way of, of making a DAO function properly. So the corporate opportunity doctrine, and it really wouldn't do much here either. So it's out the window. We're not going to worry about the corporate opportunity doctrine in DAOs. We're going to modify the duty to act in good faith. This is a duty that's a subset of the duty of loyalty that's imposed on fiduciaries. What it requires is that all people make their actions in good faith. And so you're going to hold someone liable if they had an action that was made in bad faith. Um, so we're going to keep that. You can't act in bad faith in a DAO. You can't write a smart contract that's going to be objectively terrible for the DAO. It's going to try and ruin the DAO. Um, you can't try and use your inside knowledge of the DAO to hack that DAO. There's another part the duty to act in good faith that says you're going to be liable if you don't act, if you just essentially take your hands off the will. We're going to waive that. That needs to be gone for DAOs because like, we need to have passive investors that can invest in DAOs um, and not worry that they're going to be breaching a fiduciary duty if they don't participate in every single smart contract vote. Okay. And then finally, most importantly, we're going to retain the remainder of the duty of loyalty, whatever is left. And that is the remainder of the duty of loyalty is going to prevent self-dealing. It's going to prevent opportunism. It's going to prevent someone that's a controller um, from using that power to benefit themselves as an individual instead of the DAO as a collective. And so that's uh, that's a vision. That's a proposal. Um, interesting to see uh, where this goes in the future, if there will be problems with the implied covenant, if privately ordered controls won't be able um, to sufficiently combat opportunism. My argument would be that states ought to adopt this type of governance regime, a limited yet mandatory fiduciary duty regime for DAOs. It's tailored to DAOs. It will ensure that Web3 can still you know, accomplish its laudable goals of decentralizing control, giving workers control, allowing more worker flexibility. Um, and it will at the same time make sure that we don't just allow people to self-deal or, you know, put up this kind of like gray hair, hazy area where it might be okay to self-deal. It might not be okay to self-deal. It's going to be more attractive to investors if they have some semblance of what's going on, right? And so investors know fiduciary duties. Um, they do know what the duty of loyalty is. They know that it prevents self-dealing. So investors might be more apt to deploy their DAOs or their funds and labor into a DAO if they know that there's going to be the duty of loyalty to protect protect them from harmful self-dealing by those with the power to do so. So thanks so much for watching this video. I'd love to hear if people have comments or any insights um, or pushback on anything that I've said in this video. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And I hope you have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye.